welcome to Bad Marriages in the Bible. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Kate. I'm Bill. <laughs> uh, just seeing if you're listening to the intro. I Does know. anybody listen to the podcast <laughs> intros anymore? It's like, oh, this is the same thing. It's true. I do sometimes skip yeah, like the skip first it. two minutes. So this is all pointless. <laughs> this is uh, what one of our professors <laughs> used to say all the time. He's like, the first five minutes of a sermon don't matter at all because nobody's listening to you. Mm. It's all just warm up <laughs> material. So <he> would, <laughs> That's why I... I keep my sermons five minutes long. Oh, there you go. <laughs> you have to listen to it. It's only going to last a brief time. That's right. Well, I, I don't really do that. No. Uh, I'm Sean. So there <laughs> we are. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Dandelion Ministries, where we share the grace of Jesus Christ through... <laughs> I got it wrong. I was going to say through, through your place of pain. Yeah, that's like, right. that's not right. We, just, we cause pain. So that you can know God's grace. (laughs) (laughs) We're a little punchy. Tell tell them why we're a little punchy. We're (laughs) still tired. We're tired because we, uh, as we've said at every intro, if you've never listened to one of our intros, (laughs) then you don't know this. But if you have listened, then you know that we often uh, run retreats and we go and help other churches uh, do that and do evangelistic outreach with creativity, with the arts. That's what Kate was going to say. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Dandelion Ministries, that we create space for people to experience and God's we, grace. <laughs> we inflict pain <laughs> in order to do that. <laughs> yes. And we in their place of pain. We don't really. Through creative <laughs> means. And so we were up in uh, Maine, in Bangor, Maine, at our friend's church up there. Um, uh, and we just had a great time. It was a wonderful weekend. Um, we were with our bishop, uh, Andrew Williams, and um, it was a wonderful weekend. It was very full, and we are very tired. One of the, I'll just share this very briefly to give you a window on how we use creativity when we lead retreats. Mm. And we did this actually on Mother's Day here locally at our headquarters in Long Island, That's right. which is our house, mm-hmm. <laughs> our backyard. The HQ. Yeah. And then we did it again for them. But um, we were we used the plates as a medium, and so um, the idea that we were thinking about was Jesus's promise in John fourteen when he says, "I will not leave you as orphans; I will come to you." Mm-hmm. And so we got some thrift store plates, and moms and dads and kids alike um, smashed their plates, mm-hmm. thinking about. Uh, sort of channeling and directing their energy about what it feels like to be orphaned or to be alone their or place abandoned. Of pain. We weren't causing Ooh. it, but they brought it with them, and uh, <laughs> we were inviting them to <clears throat> express that in the breaking of the plate. Exactly to get that out. And so we had these little burlap bags, and you could either hammer the bags with the plates inside them. We learned from our first experience, you know, the week before in our driveway. We were like, oh, just throw the plates, uh, throw, you know, we put the bags, we put the plates in the bags and we were like, just throw it on the driveway and it'll, it'll crack. And the bags were far too weak for such an activity. Tensile strength, as they say (laughs) in the baggage world was too light. Yeah. Like 15 (laughs) kids like threw these bags down with all their might and they splattered everywhere. Torn bags everywhere. Mm -hmm. But nobody got hurt. Everybody had a great time. And, um. The moms are very understanding. Yeah. <laughs> so they had better bags and more controlled hammers. In in Maine. In Maine. Yeah. yeah. And then we had set out little six inch by six inch canvases where they could paint those. And they took the, if they wanted to, or just leave it white. And they took the fragmented pieces of the plates and they created something new out of it, a new kind of mosaic from the broken pieces. Mm -hmm. And those looked completely different from one another Mm. from, you know, making designs with the tiniest little shards, uh, almost like sand to using big Big chunks, big chunks. Um, Some were all white. Some were very colorful. Some did make a recognizable shape, like putting it into the shape of a heart or creating a sea turtle. Bird, a sea turtle. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Or some just explored um, just colors and shapes themselves. But the effect of each one was something of new life and of um, a new creation coming Mm -hmm. out of that place of brokenness. And um, 
And then our Mother's Day one that we did here, they got to give that to their moms. Mm -hmm. And and the moms, too, had the thrill of making their own (laughs) and breaking plates for once and making their own mess and making something new out of it. But um, so they took those home with them. But at the church in Maine, we had brought up a big six foot by three foot board that we had painted white. And we put all of those little little creations on that board as one large collaborative piece. And there were 50 pieces and it looked really beautiful. Yeah, it looks great. There, we'll, we'll put something up in the next week uh, on our blog, on our website, where if you are interested in checking it out, you can and see the uh, finished product. But it was a great time. And it was, it just is another way of getting us to, as we, to, you know, engage with the gospel, creating that space where we're dealing with the realities of the a life of death and resurrection, which is mm. what the Christian life is. And so, um, and that, you know, after that, on Saturday, we, we helped uh, the church go out and serve their community and did an evangelistic outreach with them. And then we had a celebration on Sunday. So it was, it was a great weekend and um, we had a wonderful time, mm. but this is why we're a little late in the week getting to you, uh, getting you this episode. But um, we also had Kate's mom in town because we had kids concerts and everything, you know, it's, the, it's springtime kind of getting close end, to the end, end of the year. year. Yeah. So been a full week but we are with you now and we are still walking through <clears throat> song of solomon and um we finished last week talking about how he was uh kind of reassuring her of his love for her and how it wasn't solely uh sexual because <laughs> right. he's talking about friendship and friendship was the, the bedrock the of bedrock it. of it yeah of the intimacy and so uh This week, we're going to get into uh, what happens when that kind of assurance and safety is there. Right. And it's sex, just so you know. Woo! (laughs) You feel like making love. You feel like making love. That's right. (laughs) In in marriage, friendship leads to sex. And it's great. That's right. And... Yes, not mm. to be, not to confuse you out there. If you feel like you really are grateful for your friends, that doesn't mean you should have sex with them. <laughs> Although that is confusing these days for people. Sure. <laughs> and friendship on its own is a very strong, satisfying bond. It is. Mm. But in this case, in this case, that it leads to more desire. You know, when you feel that safety, when you feel that reassurance, when you've been vulnerable, because that's what. At some point, we don't see it explicitly in the text because it's all poetry. She's not like, well, then I sat him down and I told him about all my insecurities and blah, blah, blah. We don't see that. What we see is um, all of a sudden it moves from her feeling all of that in the potential dream sequence, as we were saying. And then we see him addressing it, addressing the shame, you know, the sense of shame, the sense of insecurity and, and giving her confidence again and his love for her um and the response then is like oh my gosh i love him even more like this is even better you know that's right that's right so you know she had her own broken plates that she was worried about there you go and they had experienced reassurance and reconciliation together so join us in song of solomon chapter 6 verse 11 and we had ended last episode when he had praised her for being like the dawn Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, the different lights in the sky, the sun and the moon, but that idea of dawn and a new day and um, beginning again, which is what reconciliation gives to us, you Mm -hmm. know, a new dawn every day. And so, um, and now she is um, reaffirming her love for him uh, and describing going down to a garden. A nut orchard. Yes, where there's a nut <laughs> orchard. <laughs> down to the valley. I mean, you don't have to think too hard about what she's talking about here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she's going down to the nut orchard and to the valley uh, to see whether the vines had budded and whether the pomegranates were in bloom. So she's kind of like... I wonder if he's in the mood now, you know, like after all of that worry before when he was, and then she was worried he, you know, that he would not take her back. And now she's like, I want to go down and see if he's ready for me now. And, 
And she will be very happy to find out that he is. He is. And <laughs> <laughs> he is ready. And the, the second half of verse 11 is one of the hardest to translate. Um, Song of Songs has a lot of unique. It's 12, actually. It's verse, verse 12, I think you're about to say. Um, I am. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> verse 12. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of unique words in that um, book. And this is one of the hardest verses to translate. Um, what we have is before I was aware, my desire set me among the chariots of my kinsmen, a prince. Mm. And so they're not quite sure what that meant. Um, but kind of like I, I found myself, you know, I found myself in his midst kind of idea. Yeah. And it's kind <clears> of, <throat> I mean, we've seen this, I think depicted, uh, in movies and, you know, in life kind of thing. It's like, well, we just, we knew each other for this reason or whatever. And then all of a sudden I realized like I had feelings for him or I had feelings for her kind of thing. Like before you even were aware really of your desire, you were just drawn to each other kind of thing. You were in the midst. I like that. I like uh, that. And so then, um, that wasn't the case with us. I'll just say, I just want to interrupt the, mm. your train of thought. I was, pretty sure right away yes <laughs> and i spent all my time trying to get into your midst <laughs> <laughs> so that i was like i just want to be wherever she is uh, and um and i saw the first time i saw him i was like oh my gosh i totally am into that guy but then i thought you were unattainable and i'd never see you again yeah so I, the line was that she thought i was 56 that was, <laughs> i think we've said that one before she thought i was way older than her and um you were in fact 16 at the time that i saw you <laughs> yeah i was i'm six months older than kate so i am i mean he comes I'll, across he came across as like a mature man like muscular and tall and thank you i was like now i come across as a small <laughs> troll type man <laughs> just kidding <laughs> so <laughs> different so much has changed, <laughs> so much has changed. <laughs> no uh i appreciate that thank you it's just because the six months are really significant i've I am very, very mature for those six months <laughs> older than you. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, anyway, sorry. I had to interrupt. It is wonderful, though, when you have that kind of, you know, like, oh, I all of a sudden realized that I love her or I love him. So well done you. If you if that describes you out there, it was just a, for us, it was a little more instantaneous. Yeah. She was a, an exotic person from Canada. <laughs> 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 she's not really from Canada though. I have to explain <laughs> but she she had moved from Canada <laughs> so another story for another time go ahead Kate so <laughs> so then this the scene that happens next is like the chorus of people a around the bride and groom are calling the bride to come and to dance with them mm. and then it goes into um, the second part of verse 13 at the very end of chapter six, where the, the groom looks to them and, and says, no, you know, we don't want you guys around. <laughs> yeah. I don't want her to dance for all of you. Yeah. Yeah. This is not like a dance between two armies. This is not a group dance. She is going to be dancing just with me. And so he kind of ushers them away. Mm. So they're calling her to come and to dance with them. And he's like, no, no, no. This is just between the two of us. Mm. And he shoes them out of the room. And then we get into chapter seven. Mm -hmm. And this is another one of those um, praising each other um, moments, this wasif uh, term. And this time so far, they've always gone from the top down and this time he's physically going, describing each other. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, <laughs> and this time he is going to describe her from the bottom up. And so he begins with her dancing feet and sandals, mm. which is a very erotic thing to wear. And you might imagine that might be all she's wearing, given the way he describes her. That's right. It's like her business sucks. Yes. From <laughs> the flight of the Concords. If you haven't seen it, do yourself a favor. Go watch it. But that's one of their one of my favorite songs of theirs is he talks about getting down to his, his socks and he knows business time when he's down to his business socks. <laughs> and so we like to think of these as her business sandals. That's right. And uh, so that's, there you are. If you don't know it, you'll, you are, you'll be so happy when you listen to that song. You can you, look it up on YouTube. Flight of the Concords, business time. Look it up. 
<laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. And so, so then he, you know, they definitely feel like making love. They've been reassured again of their love and this time in full view of her worries about being selfish. And so when you have that reconnection mm. and that forgiveness after kind of a moment of insecurity or selfishness or sin against one another and you have that forgiveness, it makes the bond even stronger. Yeah. And you see them, you know, the erotic the volume goes up <laughs> in the poetry. It is a higher volume here than than even in some of the other poetry cycles we've seen so far. Yeah. One of our favorite bands, we've quoted them before on this podcast, but Waterdeep, um, Don and Lori Cheffer are the couple that are the founders and kind of continuing members of Waterdeep. They sing a song called Let's Get Into a Fight. Mm. And it's kind of carrying this theme. And the idea is like, let's get into a fight and, um, baby, let's get, let's argue. Then we'll be sure that everything's all right. You know, and it's mm. kind of like this idea, like if we're just kind of stuck in the ho hum and there's no yeah, energy, right? they're just kind of saying like, if, you know, if we get into a fight, then we can make up <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing. Like there would be some passion mm. and, uh, it's true. You know, that's the joke is like the makeup, makeup sex is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we're seeing here that's right. in this passage. So he loves her dancing sandals. Um, he loves her thighs that are like jewels. Mm. Uh, the navel is a rounded bowl. And it also might be referring to her. Her hoo-hoo. Yes. We'll keep it G-rated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, be, just because next is the belly, which is a heap of wheat. And it's really the term for womb, you know, right there. And, um, and so that's you know, where you bake this great bread. <laughs> <laughs> That's where there's a bun in the oven. I mean, this is where we get this stuff, everybody. <laughs> in circles with lilies. And then he reaches her breasts, which are like these fawns. Uh, and then the her, her neck, um, which is tall and like an ivory tower. There were there was a lot of military imagery previously, you know, surrounded by shields and right. um, but this time it's just more um, beautiful and strong and a little bit more to the point. Mm. And, um, and then this time her eyes are pools in Heshbon, which were these reflecting pools and they were known for being black um, and they would reflect the sky. And so he's looking into her dark eyes and in, before they both would be captivated by their eyes and they were fluttering like doves, uh, which is also very beautiful and reflecting light and, captivating but this time her eyes they have this deep black stillness that is bringing him peace and calm and it's saturated with desire mm -hmm. for him and so he's just acknowledging that too yeah it's like welcoming you in kind of thing like the depth and all that stuff you know right yeah yes it's very intimate mm. um and her nose is like the Tower of Lebanon, which was known for its whiteness. And so before she was like, I'm dark because I've been in chapter one. I'm dark because I've been in the vineyards and working outside and my brothers haven't been nice to me. And now he's like, well, to me, your nose is lovely and creamy white. That's right. It's lovely pale. <laughs> so <laughs> I would prefer my nose to be a little, be, tan, uh, yeah. a little color. <laughs> but um, and so. And then her her head, um, before he had been, you know, is is regal, and um, the her hair is that color of purple and of royalty, and perhaps speaking about himself in third person, the king is held captive, or even you know, the king is always held captive, and you know he's speaking about himself, so mm. he's. He loves her hair and, um, and this time it's just, it breaks from the norm. Uh, you know, we've had those flock of goats the last two times mm -hmm. <laughs> and this time, um, it's just similar. He's gone through the similar body parts, but, um, there's something fresh and a little bit deeper about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he doesn't stop there. I mean, he, so he's, a, he's adoring her. He's really enjoying her dance <laughs> and uh you know as you said going from the feet up and not leaving anything out and oh i remember what i wanted to say oh. about the lack of military thing sorry okay. <laughs> i was like i was going somewhere with that um <clears throat> he ends this 
a king is held captive in the tresses of her hair. Mm -hmm. And so um, there is a captive army and it's by her, you know, it's just by her beauty. It's like the military imagery is gone. It's just, she has captivated the king by her beauty. So there is a captive and it's, but it's him. Gotcha. Great. Go ahead. Here we are. Mm. Well, and then it just gets even more explicit. So he goes from there and just marveling, you know, in verses six and on, you know, how beautiful and pleasant you are. Uh, oh, loved one with all your delights. And he talks, he gets very explicit. You're like a palm tree and your breasts are like its clusters. And I'm going to climb that palm tree and lay hold of its fruit. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> what you know, is he talking yeah, about? He's just like, the poetry is not quite as, you know, I mean, it's, it's still poetry, but it's not like, <laughs> it's not as deep as it was before. It's like, we're just gonna, this is what I'm talking about, everybody. And, uh, and, um, you know, he says, oh, may your breasts be like the clusters of the vine and the scent of your breath, like apples, which is a, also an aphrodisiac, um, in your mouth, like the best wine. So he's like, I've done a lot of great description here in poetry and now it's like <laughs> let's go <laughs> he's like i'm just ready i want you bad and um and it's great and it's still all very very beautiful and it is a i mean this is like as we've been saying this whole time as we are walking through this book it's just a picture of abundance you know it's something that it come comes back again and again is that um this isn't limiting you know it's something that i think we do culturally we think that You've seen it depicted in movies and um, TV shows and stuff like that. Like, oh, you're going to be the same person for the rest of your life, you mm. know, as if this is somehow limiting. But it's actually not. Mm. It is actually abundant. You know, the picture is one of just like you get to know the depths of this person and get to enjoy it in all new ways, you know, on and on. And, um, and like what true intimacy is. So I really like that. Mm. about this mm-hmm. you know these pictures yeah that he's painting for that's us that's right that's right yeah because i mean de- desire it's like new every time yeah <laughs> it is that's it's great and she requites this that's also a real celebration in this book the mutual love the the fact that it's being requited and it's reciprocal. It's not one more than the other. It's not one over the other, one under the other. They are meeting each other, Mm. you know, right the same way. And she also is equally ready to go as he is. And she has a bit of humor and catches what he's saying. And she says, um, because he was like, your mouth is like the best wine. And she's like, it goes down smoothly for my beloved. It's like (laughs) almost a cheesy line. Mm, Yes. (laughs) It is cheesy, but it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Gliding over lips and teeth, you know. And so she's they're just sweet talking each other and having a good time. Yeah, it's evocative it. and and it's like the right response. <laughs> and then we want to end with this key verse. Um, she says, I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. And this word desire is a rare word. And the other time that it is used in mm. the Old Testament is in um, Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, mm. in the curse that, that has been brought on because of the sin of Adam and Eve. And that um, God says to Eve, mm-hmm. um, because of this sin, you know, Adam's toil will be hard. And the earth will always work against him and his work will always be defeating. <laughs> and yes. that's true. <laughs> I'll just say, that's true. <laughs> and that's true. That's true for, for men and for women. It's true for all of us. And then for the woman, labor is going to be hard, which is also true. You know, it's hard to raise kids, it's hard to have kids. Mm. And that is true for women and also true. For the father too it's not easy for either of them no, so <laughs> um and that there would be that misplaced desire he said your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you right. and here we have the redemption of that mm. misplaced um it wasn't the way it was created it was created for them to be uh both reflecting the image of god and to be one flesh um so that got out of whack because of sin and he, and through Jesus's 
forgiveness and death and resurrection on the cross, there is a redemption and there is a forgiveness of sin, of our sin and a reconciliation between us and God and us and one another. And that is what you see here. His his desire is for me. Mm-hmm. Inside of your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Mm-hmm. She is saying he actually desires me. You know, he's I'm not second place anymore. You know, he wants me and we are reunited again. There has been a reconciliation here um, and a redeemed desire. We're desiring the right things again. We're desiring the things that God has given us to desire. Right. Yeah. And there's no competition or anything like that involved because that's what happens, right? The, I mean, as you, as you have described, the the fall resulted in a death of relationship, a death of safety in relationship, and uh, a death to that mutual submission to each other, the death to um, really being for one another. And because that's when it says that in Genesis 3.15, um, 16. 16, yeah, thank you. Uh, it says, um, you know, it's really meaning like her desire will be for his position, mm. you know, like he will, she will actually desire to be in the space of her husband and he will rule over her. And, um, and so like there is that by itself, the desire is very skewed and, um, as you said, and it is, it is just full of competition and kind of division between the two of them as a result of the fall. And I mean, it's the battle of the sexes, right? It's a cliche that we have, you know, and, and that has been true. We, we can attest to all the brokenness in our world. You know, that verse sums it up in so many ways. When we talk about the glass ceiling for women and all of that, we talk about hierarchy, we talk about patriarchy, all these things. It's, all right there. You want to know mm. where it comes from? It's from sin and from the fall, and it is a result of the fall. And so the redemption of it is actually, as Kate's saying, it's the it's the opposite. It's not that her desire is for him, although we know that she does desire him as we've been walking through this book. We see that he desires her mm. in that way, you know, using that same word, um, and that there is now actually mutuality as you were saying like this <clears throat> reciprocation through this whole thing this both people um in this relationship are going out of their way to love the other and to celebrate the other and to describe the other you know and to and it's all this beautiful picture of of um mutuality i don't know how in the ministry of reconciliation right like you the said the kind of reconciling love that god gives to a husband and a wife right that he does to th- to us through each other all the time. Yeah. So it is a beautiful picture of the fruit of the gospel um, and that we see marriage reflecting mm-hmm. for us. Mm-hmm. Reconciliation. It doesn't always happen, but when it does, it's beautiful and it's such a witness to what the Holy Spirit can do. Mm-hmm. And we always like to pull back a little bit and give the typological view too. So if you're relating to this as a single person, um, and putting yourself in the bride's position with the groom being Jesus, um, then we can sort of pull back a little bit from the erotic, mm-hmm. <laughs> immediate, um, literal translation, which is what it, the first purpose is for. But there is also another interpretation that has been, you know, handed down for cent- centuries um, mm-hmm. in the church. But you have to pull back a little bit and. Um, see it from a little bit farther away. But that word desire is in Genesis chapter 3, 16, um, about the broken power relationship between a man and a woman because of sin that's now redeemed. But it's also in Genesis 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 7, when Cain is being tempted to murder his brother Abel. Mm. And... Um, and uh, the Lord is speaking to Cain, and he says, um, why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be, um, no, I want to go here. Um, <laughs> sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Mm-hmm. And Ca- Cain fails terribly at that. Yes. <laughs> he kills his brother instead. But sin is crouching at the door. 
Its desire is for you. And that's the other use of desire right there. And so seeing that what sin has done, what you're talking about, the way you can see it written all throughout Mm-hmm. our history. <laughs> yes. Um, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you. And what God has done is not just let us to ourselves to try to deal with it, but he has broken in and entered into our sin and taken it upon himself in Jesus and overcome it by putting it to death on the cross and rising again. And so this is the word that only faith through the Holy Spirit can say that, you know what, God's desire is for me, actually. Mm-hmm. He is for me. And that is only, you know, you can't say that if you don't know mm-hmm. what he's done for you. If you don't know his forgiveness for you, that is only something that faith can say. Mm-hmm. Only something the Holy Spirit can give you the ability to say that Jesus' desire is for me, that he wants to be for me, Mm -hmm. even at my worst. Um, Paul says that to Timothy mm -hmm. in the New Testament. So it's only by the power of the Spirit that anybody can confess this and say that. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you see this beautiful confession of faith right Mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Um, This fruit of the Holy Spirit. And um, so... That is true. That is the gospel. Mm. (laughs) Jesus is for you. His desire is for you to save you and to forgive and to redeem and to reconcile you to himself. And the first miracle often that happens is that you stop desiring your sin. Mm. You know, uh, you see that in Romans 7, Paul starts to not like his sin. And we love our sin. Oh, my gosh. We love our little character defects. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So we do the fact that that begins to change and you begin to be like, you know what? That's actually my enemy. That does not help me at all. That, that hurts me and that hurts my spouse or that hurts my, you know, kids. Um, and that hurts my relationship with God. That is the first miracle that the Holy spirit gives you, gives you a desire for something better Mm -hmm. than the sin. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. (laughs) So take us home, kid. (laughs) Well, We appreciate your time today. You can check out the show notes for Sean's email and our website, dandelionministries.org. There's a way to give through that if you'd like to support the show. Um, We invite you also to subscribe. If you just sort of blip in to like listen to episodes here or there, but you can actually subscribe to the show and these episodes will come right to you. Mm. (laughs) So, And share this with your friends. Um, thank you so much for your time today and we hope you have a good one. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.